see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And this is uh, Dialogues on Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Emile Bruneau, who's a, uh, I, I'm up on your website here, Emile, and it says you're a, a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, uh, Sachs uh, lab in, at MIT. Uh -huh. Is that right? And right. uh, you've been uh, working on, on conflict resolution and kind of studying it in, in the lab and uh, looking at uh, kind of how empathy fails and uh, kind of kind of doing hands-on studies of, as I understand it, of, of, of conflict and like what methods work, what methods don't work and really kind of studying it, um, you know, using fMRI uh, type uh, tools in the lab. And so could you just maybe introduce yourself a little bit more, kind of just build on that? Sure, yeah. Um... Well, it, it, uh, I'm, I'm a scientist now, but it's been kind of a circuitous route that's uh, taken me here. I was a teacher for a number of years and uh, also spent a lot of time traveling and living overseas uh, and also volunteering at conflict resolution camps. Um, so, uh, uh, and actually my, my relationship with the concept of empathy goes back uh, much further than that. Um, so, I guess to, uh, to set up Kind of why I'm here and and yeah, why I'm the whole history, your whole empathic history. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I actually um, so from a personal level, I, I grew up with uh, a mother who's schizophrenic, and um, I think that was the the first and dramatic exercise, uh, starting as far as I can remember in trying to expand my empathy to encompass uh, a mental state that was completely unfamiliar with my own. Um, so that, uh, that helped me define what the issues and the problems were. Um, and whenever I'm studying empathy now, I, I feel like I kind of go back to that time to think about, uh, what does it really mean when I say empathy, uh, what am I talking about? Because I think there's a, there's a fair amount of, uh, flexibility in how the term is used. And I think many of the definitions are perfectly accurate ways to use the term empathy, but they capture very different cognitive processes. Mm -hmm. So it's, so as I'm understanding it, that your mother was, had schizophrenia and kind of you were kind of interacting with her and it was, I guess you were trying to read her and empathize with her situation and maybe right. you're having so, trouble or... or... So I, I was, you know, one one thing that you try to do as a, as a five-year-old boy is you try to understand what it is to have a, a completely different version of reality. Given the same sensory inputs that are around you, um, how can she be perceiving everything so much differently? Um, so that is trying to understand, um, uh, understand what she is experiencing. So, uh, so is that, as, is that is that empathy or kind of understanding or, or maybe both? Right. So um, I think two common definitions of empathy are thinking what somebody else is thinking. That's sometimes referred to as cognitive empathy. Um, another definition is feeling as somebody else is feeling, um, and that's oftentimes referred to as uh, sympathetic um, to what they to what they feel. Both of those uh, can be termed empathy and often are in the literature, right? both thinking as somebody else is thinking and feeling as somebody else is thinking. But for me, the, the aspect of empathy that, or the definition of empathy that seems the most important to me is not feeling as someone else feels or thinking as somebody else feels, but feeling for somebody else. So ultimately, I think that that's the type type of empathy that seems to drive a lot of our pro-social behaviors in society is feeling for somebody else. You don't necessarily, I didn't have to necessarily know exactly what it was to have an auditory hallucination or spontaneous paranoia in order to feel compassion for my mom. And the people who would help her on the streets, uh, the social worker who finally kind of 
pulled her up from uh, where she was to, to get her into a more stable condition, that social worker didn't need to feel as she felt or think as she thought. Um, she just needed to feel for her. So I say this because um, this has become really important as I try to develop experiments that are trying to measure empathy. Because the first question for me is always, what do I mean? By yeah. Empathy? And well, I think this is an important question also for programs, uh, conflict resolution programs that have a specific goal of, uh, well, they say improving empathy or increasing empathy for the other side. Uh, whenever I talk with these groups, uh, I want them to be very explicit about what they mean. Does it just mean that they want them, that they want one side to understand how the other side thinks? Do they want just to have the other side um, understand how the other side feels when they do X? Or do they really want them to have compassion for the other side and be motivated to help them? So I think these are uh, really important questions to ask yourself as a practitioner and especially as a scientist when you're trying to operationalize these. Well, what I'm looking at is how do we create a culture of empathy? It's like how do we basically raise the empathy level within society and something that's come up uh, quite often is uh, around that is, well, if we're going to build a culture of empathy, we better have a definition of what we're talking about. Yeah. So you're kind of speaking to, uh, to that definition. And I could just uh, kind of share uh, kind of the basic definition that I've been using is seeing empathy as a, f and maybe get your feedback on it, is seeing empathy as kind of a four parts. Uh, the first part uh, is self-empathy, so it's kind of self-awareness, mindfulness, sensory awareness of what's going on uh, in, in the body. And then the second is kind of a mirrored empathy, which is through mirror neurons, that is, as you're watching me move my hands all over the place, uh, you're mirroring that through mirror neurons, and, and I'm mirroring back uh, with, it, with mirror neurons kind of what, uh, you know, kind of your state, which is a little bit more... Uh, serious, perhaps. So, so what <laughs> for is, the moment, <laughs> what, what's, uh, what what contribution uh, do you think that gives? Um, if I have mirror neurons that are just um, kind of mirroring your actions, uh, so is that is that part? Is that a required part of the of empathy of the cascade? Yeah, I would say it. It's part of the. Let me just finish, and then maybe we can uh -huh. go back, and then the. Uh, Kind of the third part is what I call imaginative empathy, but in the literature, I think it's called, you know, in the scientific literature, it tends to be called uh, perspective taking or cognitive empathy. So it's uh -huh. that taking the position of someone else and saying, well, if I was in their situation with all these, uh, you know, environmental or whatever, uh, you know, things happening, I would be doing this. And then the uh, fourth part is uh, empathic action. And I see that um, manifest, for example, in conflict resolution, where the parties are mad at each other, there's a lack of empathy, uh, they, they, you get them to start empathizing with each other sometimes by modeling empathy uh, to, to each side or, you know, even empathizing with them. And As then... Action? Is, what? Uh, is that action-based? <clears throat> yeah, it's that, that, it's that the, uh, they... It, towards the last part is that they start taking action together that has like a smooth flow to it. And I've heard it described as, someone described it as empathy is when the, the blocks to action are removed that don't exclude. So the, conf the people in conflict start understanding each other and they move together to create kind of a, a new structural reality or something like that. So that's the kind of the basic model uh, I've been working from. So just wondering how that resonates with... Well, I think there, there are a bunch of interesting questions in there. Um, one interesting question for me on the front of, uh, of kind of an automatic process that, that might be encoded by something like mirror neurons. Uh, one question that's uh, arisen for me about that is, uh, what about people who are blind or who have, uh, have so, lack some kind of basic sensory inputs? Um, does that mean that they're less able to empathize because they're 
of course, not able to encode that type of information. And my intuition is, is no, that, that they're able to empathize just as well as anybody else. And I think most of the literature out there, especially on people who are congenitally blind, show that their deficits are purely sensory, that they, they're not conceptual. They don't have any conceptual deficits, even if it's things like um, understanding words that are sight-based. Um, they know what it means to see something. But the, the, uh, the transmission of that mirroring comes just through audi auditory as well, as well as even physical touch. Right, if I'm not saying anything and, and just touching you in kind of a soft, gentle way, I'm able to mirror that as well. So it's like well, all I'm the not different. Sure, if that's known actually. No. Um, I mean, the the mirror neur neuron research in monkeys is pretty clear that it's observing you know, their action visually. Um, I, I'm not sure how far they've taken it in monkeys, and I certainly don't know if they've, they've done that research in humans. So it's an interesting idea, and it's a good hypothesis. I'm just not sure if, if the research has been done yet. Um, and as far as the, the other kind of tracks down the way, I think that um, you know your intuition, your personal intuition, and, and mine also, because a lot of, uh, I feel like the science has a lot of catching up to do, right? There's the, the science, especially the neuroscience on empathy, is at a very low level and beginning stage right now in my mind. So um, a lot of what we're working on now is just trying to uh, go from our intuition. So my intuition matches yours in many ways in that there's some kind of cascade of empathy that it helps to be able to know what somebody else is thinking to, to feel empathy for them. But just knowing what somebody else is thinking doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do something nice for them. And we can see this in conflict situations quite often, right? I, I think that knowing what somebody else is thinking or feeling doesn't mean that you have to act pro-socially towards them. In fact, it can result in the exact opposite. In order to feel schadenfreude or pleasure at somebody else's pain, you have to know what they're feeling and thinking also. So just knowing what they're thinking and feeling or being able to experience it yourself, I don't think that's a, uh, it might help, uh, but it, it might also hinder the process of empathy. So this idea that, uh, that it's a, a complex process and that it might be a cascade um, and that somewhere down that cascade, you can fall one direction towards empathy or another direction towards the opposite. I think all of these are ideas that uh, are interesting and, and provocative and that'll be you know, fun to flesh out in the research, or at least that's what I'm hoping to do. So it could even be more than a cascade. It could be a uh, kind of an interaction, kind of a spoke on a wheel type a model too, that, you know, maybe one isn't dependent, but there might be interactions between the different, sure. it, it would be maybe another model yeah. of that. So the other part that you're talking about, it seems that you're kind of addressing is uh, empathic uh, concern is, I, I, it, it seems to be the part that you're kind of speaking to that is that you're concerned about or that you're kind of interested in is how how do people have a, a sense of concern and then want to take some kind of action to alleviate uh, pain or suffering or right well I guess um, I'm, I'm I'm starting my research at the end point I'm starting at a place where um, people from different groups have an obvious lack of caring towards each other's suffering um, so, so that's where I kind of want to work backwards from. So if that's the end point, what do I know about the intervening steps there? And will it help us to understand the, the intervening steps to, to know what types of interventions will work? So, I mean, part of the, part of the issue is um, we want to be able to measure empathy. We want to be able to understand how much one group or one person is empathizing with another group. And the reason we want to know this is not purely out of curiosity, although it would be really interesting to know how the brain is processing this. For me, it's a, it's a practical point, which is I want to be able to know how much empathy they're feeling for another group so that I can see if this changes over time, so that we can um, measure the effectiveness of programs that are designed specifically to increase empathy for another group. So ideally, I would love to have measures of these different definitions of empathy that we're talking about. I would love to have an accurate neural measure of um, thinking what somebody else is thinking. 
or cognitive empathy. I would love to have a separate neural measure of feeling as somebody else's feeling, right? Or emotional empathy. And I would love to have a measure of feeling for somebody else's suffering or pain. So, uh, or we might call that sympathy. Uh, so if you have all these measures, then I feel like you would be able then to uh, kind of use them as diagnostic tools to see, well, this intervention maybe is increasing their ability to understand what the other group is feeling, but if it's not changing how they feel for that other group suffering, then is that really the goal? Is that really what we want? Um, and if it's not, then okay, well, let's tweak it. Let's change the program a little bit and see if we can actually affect this type of empathy that we're really interested in. So you're really right right now, as I understand it, you're looking for those measurements, those ways yes, of measuring. I, yeah, the the first studies we did were uh, have been just basically looking at um, is there a difference in how the brain uh, processes other people in physical pain versus other people in emotional pain. Because my uh, intuition was that when, when we're talking about conflict situations and we're talking about failures of empathy, that those generally occur uh, on the level of failing to empathize with somebody else's suffering, failing to empathize with uh, their humiliation or loss of loved ones or loss of livelihood that those are the types of failures that I, I tend to be most interested in because they seem to be the ones that are most relevant to conflict resolution. So the first very basic question is, are these different from, um, you know, does the brain process these types of events differently from watching somebody else in physical pain? And so that was the first set of studies just to see if those are different. And then we wanted to see, well, can we get a, a neural signature of these uh, within each of these brain regions, they they turned out to be very distinct from each other. There were some brain regions that responded to other people in physical pain, a distinct set of brain regions that responded to people in emotional suffering. Um, now that they're separate, can we manipulate these? Can we see, um, are the responses different if you're looking at people who are from conflict groups? And again, these brain regions, I feel like are just at the very first step of empathy. So I don't think that, that uh, reading about somebody else's suffering and seeing that brain activity in a person's brain, that itself doesn't mean that you're feeling for the other person. To me, it just means that you're representing that other person's suffering in your brain. And those are the brain regions that are responsible for just representing it. Mm -hmm. So so we have, we have or and that was just the first step. So the, the first step that you're measuring is, is, is uh, mirroring uh, part of mirroring someone's pain and suffering is, is I like the one necessarily yes. mirroring. I, I, uh -huh. I'm pretty oh. agnostic over whether <clears throat> mm -hmm. it's the same exact brain regions that would be active if you were thinking about uh, if you were experiencing that humiliating event yourself, for example. I tend to think that that's not the case in humans for these types of uh, for things like humi humiliation uh, and suffering because these require a fair amount of cognition. You have to know uh, what the other person is all about. One, something that's humiliating for one person might not be for another person. So I think having an automatic system that is, that is on if you see an event is very low level. And I, I feel like a lot of human empathy, especially for suffering, uh, which has this emotional, mental, contextual component to it, um, has to be higher level than that. It has to be something that isn't automatic. That's something that is uh, dependent upon higher level brain processes. But uh, I think that question is still open. Yeah, so it's it's very complicated still what's going on. You're really trying to break it down and, and kind of, uh, you know, tease out the different aspects. And one part, though, what I'm hearing a little bit, though, is you were kind of talking about empathy as it was applied to uh, suffering and humiliation and kind of uh, kind of negative uh, emotions, uh -huh. but there's also the empathy as applied to joy, to feeling someone else's joy, seeing someone else's creativity. I, I do kind of like a freestyle dance like every week. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's like, there's no pain and suffering in that. It's just like fun. And it's like, there's just all this interaction going and um, it's a lot of fun. And that's kind of how I've seen empathy is empathy is applied to the broad spectrum of, of other people's experiences, 
whereas uh, maybe uh, compassion and um, empathic concern is kind of applied to that spectrum of you know the suffering and the uh, does that kind of resonate with yeah, well, I, you know, my, my research focus tends towards the macabre since <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly dealing with groups that, that actually dislike each other quite a bit. And it seems like the, the negative emotions are, are pretty prevalent there. But I agree with you that, um, you know, there, there might be something, uh, there might also be a deficit or an empathy gap when it comes to positive events um, that you might feel uh, more happy and more empathic towards an in-group member a member of your own group who's going through something really wonderful and you might not have that same experience for a member of the conflict group who's going through that same thing. Um, how that affects, uh, whether that's more concerning for a conflict, whether that helps drive the conflict or not, I think, again, is an open question, but uh, it's, it's a direction I want to go as well to see if these are very different from each other or very similar. And, and as I mentioned, I'm kind of looking at how do we build a culture of empathy, and you're kind of like looking at the conflict part, which is like, hey, this is where empathy is not. So do you yes. see like a culture of empathy as something to strive for and something to work for? Well, absolutely. And I mean, all of this research is, again, just to establish the tools that, that, make, that allow me to measure when things have broken down. Right? That's just the first step, though, right? The, the more hopeful step is, okay, well, how do you build it up from there? Um, so that's exactly what it's about. You know, the first step is the uh, is the most miserable, right? It's <laughs> trying, trying to develop tools to to really give you a good idea when somebody is uh, is really suffering, or when somebody is failing to respond to somebody else's suffering. Um, the, the next steps are the ones that are, of course, more hopeful and more interesting and more valuable. Well, well, to bring in a little bit of the the uh, positive aspect, what what do you see as the vision of a culture of empathy, like what does that culture, I mean, we're seeing the wars, the conflicts, I mean, just in the politics, I mean, it's like the, the problems are kind of like uh, endless out there. What, what is it that you're kind of imagining a culture of empathy to, to look like? Wow, what, what am I, well, um, I, I think, what am I imagining a culture? Well, I, I'm not exactly sure what, uh, what your culture of empathy is. I mean, I can take a guess that it's increasing empathy uh, in the whole group. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a fair amount of research showing that if you, if you can increase uh, your empathy towards another group, that your pro-social actions towards that group can improve. I think empathy is kind of the, uh, the type of empathy feeling for another person uh, I, I think it it serves as one of the bedrocks for modern human civilization. I think humans are remarkable uh, empaths. I think our, our ability for it is incredible. I think it's it's amazing to me always that you can get um, humans, even very young humans, to feel a strong emotional attachment or to feel a strong amount of empathy towards uh, fictional characters that they know are fictional, even characters that are uh, that are representations of animals, not even animals themselves in the form of cartoons. I think Heider and Simmel showed this beautifully with their uh, studies in the 50s where they got people to empathize very strongly with uh, a triangle in a circle being chased around by a square just in stop motion animation. That you can feel the effect if you just put those shapes in relation to each other where it implies that the, the square is the drunk father who's abusing the triangle who's trying to uh, protect the, the poor circle from the abusive father. If you just put those shapes in a position that implies that type of situation, then you can get people to empathize with these shapes. I, I feel like it's, it's built into us, but that example right there, I don't think that that's something that's uh, an automatic process, an automatic low-level process. It might happen to us, but that requires a huge amount of symbolic inference, that type of task, right? We know that those objects aren't people. We know that, they, uh, that they're just geometric objects, and yet we feel for them. So we have to go through a remarkable amount of uh, very human processing to get to that point. And then when we get there, it's an overpowering feeling. 
and I love that that empathy is this flexible that it can uh, that it can wrap around so many different aspects of our life that we can feel empathy for for a person we can feel empathy for a character in a painting that was painted 400 years ago so I think this ability is remarkable and it's really uh, just fascinating to try to get at some of the pieces of it because I feel like getting at empathy is really getting at something that's uh, that's kind of deeply and essentially human. So what it means to build a culture of empathy, I feel like we have some uh, very human tendencies that uh, that allow us to kind of live in our big complex societies and to have these uh, you know these these remarkable complex and cooperative um, uh, kind of environments and structures that we have we have universities and we have hospitals and we have uh, healthcare workers and all these uh, seem to be helped along by this uh, human capacity for empathy so I think building that culture of course it's it's a uh, it's kind of appealing to the to our best angels, uh, and it allows us to to have the culture that we have. So, in that respect, of course, I feel like building a culture of empathy uh, only emphasizes what makes us remarkable in our humanity and what makes us our best selves. So, I would support it. As a scientist, I feel like um, what we understand about empathy is a tiny little sliver. Uh, compared to what we know about empathy well, there's as a, humans. Well, oh, there's another way of, of uh, looking at it is I'm actually just brought up your Facebook page, and I think you're a new father as well. Is that right? Indeed, yeah. So, I mean, that's really about empathy there, if, if as, as I understand, um, you know, family and, and connection. and Absolutely, although, you know, one thing about empathy is that I, I don't necessarily think that um, turning up empathy in every person is necessarily the answer. I think one of the remarkable things about human empathy is how, how flexible it is, right? So how we can wrap it around even inanimate objects, but also how, um, how we can control it. And I think this ability to control it is actually really important also. Uh, if a social worker really felt full empathy every time he or she went into work, it would just crush them, right? They wouldn't be able to function as a person. If an ER doctor fully felt the pain of every patient coming in, then they would be incapacitated. So this ability to empathize, I think it's important to be able to regulate it as well so that we can go about being humans. I, I think it's in the, the beekeeper's daughter. There, there's some story about uh, a a number of sisters, and one of the sisters is actually unable to turn off her empathy. She feels so much for the suffering of others that it eventually drives her to her own death. And I think that uh, that, that you know parable maybe is uh, is important to keep in mind that empathy, of course, it's it's one of the most important pro-social things that that humans can feel and that motivates humans to act in pro-social ways, but. Um, but I think it shouldn't be discounted that um, that our ability to regulate empathy is important for our regular activity. And when I think about my child, um, you know, she's almost four months old right now, so she's in that point in her life where she's she's trying to learn how to go to sleep. And if she is very tired, but she's not able to go to sleep, she gets very upset. And if she's crying like mad. If I feel full empathy, then I can't be the best father, right? I, I'm just totally incapacitated and I don't know what to do and I feel awful and that's not necessarily the best state to be in when you're trying to take care of an infant. So, you know, of course, um, there are many tendrils to this, right? It's important. Uh, it, it's made me think so much about uh, uh, the sanctity of young life. And it makes me generalize to all infants all around the world. And it brings out empathy in other people. Whenever people see me with a child, you can see that it affects them in a really positive way. Um, so there are those aspects of empathy that are really positive, but I have to reflect on how it affects me and my own empathy and trying to uh, be very careful about regulating it in a way. Like, 
being really happy that my overall empathy uh, gets a boost from having this child, but also being very careful about you know how, how I how I dole it out and how I keep it under wraps and when I dole it out and when I keep it under wraps and uh, you know it's it's a really difficult thing trying to trying to temper something without dulling it right trying to shape something without suppressing it and I think that's you know it's just inevitable it's one of the one of the wonderful things about a complex emotion right is that it's not straightforward how uh, what to do with it. It's not straightforward that you should just feel more of it. I think it's uh, it's nuanced and and it's important to recognize that. Well, one of the uh, nuances <clears throat> is seems to me to be the part about going from empathy to sympathy or even empathic concern. So, if the empathic concern is, well, I'm feeling, you know from you know imagination or emotionally what it is that's going on for you and i can kind of be there and kind of uh, reflect uh, that and be present with that but then if it starts affecting me as a secondary response and the sympathy is i'm you know from people i'm talking to is the sympathy is kind of like a secondary response like oh you're you're in pain and suffering then i'm in pain and suffering but it, it it's kind of like it's kind of going beyond just feeling what's going on for you. And it, it's that, that secondary uh, symp sympathetic response that it is maybe what leads to the burnout more than maybe just the em empathy. Yeah, I, I think the, that your terminology, uh, I think that uh, how I would interpret that in the maybe more scientific terminology is, is again, the feeling as versus feeling for. I think feeling for my daughter is a good thing. I have to understand that she's distressed. I have to do something to take care of that. And I have to feel motivated to do that, right? If, if I didn't feel anything about her crying, if it didn't disturb me at all, then I wouldn't be very helpful. But for me to feel as she's feeling, to literally feel, uh, you know, totally stressed out about being completely tired and not being able to fall asleep and not understanding what's going on and being confused and you know being hungry but I don't know what to do feeling all those feelings feeling as she's feeling is not necessarily productive so maybe that's what you're getting at is yeah, that right. feeling one of those feeling for her that's great feeling as her maybe not so helpful oh and just so you know I'm, I'm about to uh, run out of juice here it looks like oh, okay <laughs> My computer. Uh, I had I to knew. steal off into a separate room. I have a shared office, so oh, okay. I'm holed away in our behavioral testing room. Oh, so then, you're on a laptop and you're about to run yeah. out of uh, battery. So. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, well we can um, we can let it. Uh, we could go a little bit longer, and if you disappear, we'll know why. So, okay. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if we suddenly uh, don't see you, that, that'll be the end. <laughs> so. Um, yeah the uh so was, <clears throat> so what what do you think then is where is your work kind of leading kind of what are you seeing as the future of your work where where you want to work you were saying something about the you know the measurement is that really where you're you're going now or yeah well the measurement as a means to an end um the measurement uh right now is to try to develop tools that give me a handle on uh on empathic fa failures um i kind of my other branch of my research right now is to directly evaluate conflict resolution efforts and conflict resolution programs and on site in conflict regions. So um, I did a behavioral study, for example, in the Middle East with Palestinians and Israelis to see what types of interactions had a positive effect uh, on their attitudes towards the other group. And my hypothesis there was that it might be a different interaction for each group because they differ in terms of how much power they have. In the situation, and that turned out to be true. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at these. Uh, I feel like there are a lot of conflict resolution programs that are out there, um, but very little evaluation of the programs. The programs tend to be set up by by very wonderful and well-meaning members of the dominant group, um, and so they're going based on their intuitions. But their intuitions might only be serving one side, and it might be underserving or serving oppositely the other side. So I'm very concerned with um, making sure that all this wonderful energy that we're pouring into conflict resolution efforts is actually having the effect that we intend. 
And you have to have tools to measure that effect if you're going to answer that question. So I'm trying to simultaneously do these two things. Evaluate using the measures that we have right now, conflict resolution efforts, and develop new measures that can be used in the future so that we can get a handle on this effort. And I don't think it has to be limited to uh, groups that are in active conflict right now. I think that it would be really great to develop tools that could allow us to get at some of these processes in interpersonal relationships or uh, multicultural societies where the groups aren't necessarily at loggerheads, but, uh, but there's definitely a difference in power and perspective between the groups and there might be a gap in empathy. So uh, all these things are really interesting to me and I'm, I'm kind of trying to tackle them all at once. So you're, is, you're, you're actually going to go to those conflict uh, zones and then actually do research kind of in the field there? Yeah, so, so I have. Um, I have uh, in the Middle East, and I also kind of replicated the effects in Arizona over the immigration issue, so between white Americans and Mexican immigrants. And, you know, hopefully this summer we'll head to South Africa um, to look at the kind of psychological effects that are going on there between black colored and white populations post-apartheid. Um, I would love to go to Sri Lanka. Hopefully that will be in the near future. So yeah, all, all these regions are, are places where I'd really love to go. They're places that I've gone in the past. So it would be, you know, I, I lived in South Africa for a little while and in Sri Lanka um, and in Ireland. So I'd love to go back to these places and kind of formally investigate some of the things that I just uh, experienced and observed when I was there as a tourist. So what is your uh, kind of preliminary research kind of shown you? Has there been some findings that you find that are very relevant? Yeah, well, with the Israelis and Palestinians, the, you know, what I wanted to do is test the effectiveness of perspective taking um, on attitudes towards the other group. And uh, my assumption was that it would work for members of a dominant group, but it wouldn't be effective for members of a non-dominant group. And so that was the first finding was that perspective taking improved attitudes of Israelis towards Palestinians, but not the other way around. And in fact, what worked for Palestinians was being on the other side of that equation, being able to just speak and be listened to by a member of the other side. That's what improved their attitudes towards Israelis. And that didn't have an effect on Israelis' attitudes towards Palestinians. So it was the opposite interventions uh, that had the effect on the different groups. And I think this uh, is generally uh, generalizable to uh, to conflict between groups where there's a difference in power. So in, in a power dynamics, the people in power, the perspective taking is more effective and for the in the less power groups to being heard uh, yeah. capacity is so maybe it's like somehow combining the two or what? Yeah, perspective taking and perspective giving. Yeah. And I, I think that this is, uh, this is an assumption that isn't shared, right? There's, there's a lot of money poured into the voice of America, uh, but there's very little money poured into the ear of America, right? Mm -hmm. We have an assumption that we need to get our voice heard, but that might not be, that might actually be the exact wrong thing to do when we, as the, the most powerful country in the world, are trying to communicate with others who are less powerful. Well, that, that was a, a nice uh, metaphor, the ear of America. I really like that. Um, when the, you know, the uh, definition of empathy is often the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes and looking through someone else's eyes. And I've, I've uh, asked people about what is your personal metaphor of empathy? So if empathy is, you know, what's your image of what empathy looks like as land or an animal or machine or anything? And it's amazing to me that every, almost everybody has a different metaphor for what empathy is like. For me, empathy is like a cornucopia. And so I was wondering for you, if you had to create like a metaphor of empathy, what is uh, empathy like? Oh, wow. I, I think I'm still deep in that process. I'm, I'm still trying to combine all the metaphors I've heard in the past and see which one, uh, which one wins out the day. Um, I think it's a great question, and, and uh, I'll take that as a challenge to answer that question over the next couple of years as I'm doing my research. Okay, yeah, sometimes the scientists, they don't like to play with metaphors. I've, <laughs> I've interviewed some scientists, and they've said, you know, metaphors is just not my thing. I like the <laughs> so so you're in good company <laughs> around that. That's we'll leave that for some of the artists uh, then. 
or for the for a future uh, interview. Yeah. So Great. okay, in in terms of uh, any kind of uh, other uh, topics you think is important to cover, maybe in terms of you know kind of wrapping up or that you think we haven't covered. Um. No, I, I mean, I, I very much feel like um, most of my experience with empathy has been as a non-scientist, that, uh, that I, uh, I, I've experienced it and I believe in it very much for myself personally, and I believe in, uh, in its power uh, as a society. Um, I feel like uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to comment on it as a scientist because I feel like our understanding is so paltry uh, compared to uh, humanity's understanding of empathy. I think one of the one of the things that that science can do and and I think has been doing is helping us to to better define what we mean by the word. Because again, I think it's uh, it's really important, uh, especially from a practical point of view for getting people who are really concerned with changing empathy or improving empathy or um, establishing empathy to understand themselves what they really mean by that because the how they define it uh, means a completely different process, I think, cognitively, um, but certainly experientially. Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, something that's kind of been brought up in the literature around empathy is, is people have kind of pointed out that uh, through history, at least in the last couple hundred years, scientists and academics have argued a lot around the notion that we're greedy, selfish, self-interested uh, beings. And that now there seems to be this new kind of paradigm shift or the this new science, especially about mirror neurons and so forth, saying, hey, it's not that's not quite the full picture that we're also basically have this empathy and you know so there's kind of this historic kind of shift that uh, some people talk about does that seem accurate to you well i i think i'm right in line with richard dawkins i, I think i'm right in line with all of those uh uh the competition um uh the nasty aspects that come from competition i think all of that served us really well in getting us to where we are through the course of evolution. But I feel like uh, those competitive genes have ceded a lot of power to our cortex. And now we get to decide. We have a lot more uh, control over what we do. So we still have those impulses within us, but it's up to us now. And they were really valuable and very important to get us where we are. Uh, but now, you know, we've grown past that. <laughs> we've graduated. And, and now we, uh, we have the ability to do much better, not just heeding those, uh, those kind of basic impulses, but relying instead on what those impulses gave us, what evolution has endowed us with now, which is this wonderful cortex with uh, these remarkable abilities. Uh, and we should go with it. <laughs> we should develop that. We should, like you say, build a culture of empathy, that we should, um, we should have faith in in what evolution has uh, has endowed us with, so um, well, that culture of empathy is actually a set of neuro circuitry in a sense, right? Creating new pathways or strengthening the existing pathways, maybe uh, in our brains that are those pathways for empathy. Yeah, sure, could be. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> but we'll have to research it and kind of exactly uh -huh, kind of really get the I data. Have, gee, I'm a scientist. <laughs> well, here's a, there's one thing that is coming up is that th there's different ways of 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 uh, exploring a theme, and the idea within science has been that while well, you do it at this detached cognitive uh, level, right? It's a detached cognitive. Uh, uh, function, this uh, uh, reason. And there's also another view saying that you explore phenomenon through empathizing with it, right? I don't know if I, you, you probably know this better than I, but... Um, what do you mean the, by detached and cognitive? It, it's like often, you know, scientists are seen as detached from experience, that they're kind of outside, you know, George Lakoff writes about this, um, you know, kind of the embodied mind that we that the mind is like 
embody that you can't be detached from reason that reason is not a detached uh, uh, state of being on its own and I've seen some you know people in science they talk about actually imagining if you're studying you know neurons or something imagining yourself being the neuron you know the and kind of role taking and so there's there seems to be a, a process of inquiry that actually uses empathy versus kind of just maybe detached reasoning or something so well i, I think there are a couple of issues there i, I mean I, I totally agree with einstein that imagination is more important than knowledge in in scientific inquiry so i agree with you there and i think that sometimes science suffers from that but i think a lot of that perception about science being detached is just the reality of how you have to run an experiment. I mean, I would love to know how someone uh, experiences empathy when they read uh, about a character in Dickens. But if I have somebody watching a Dickens film in the scanner and I see brain activity, I don't know whether that's because it's their visual cortex seeing different scenes. I don't know if it's them semantically processing the information that's coming in. I don't know if it's because they're thinking back to a childhood memory. There are just too many variables. And so, of course, what we have to do in science is break it down to smaller pieces because that's the only way we can get any kind of answer. You can't, I mean, we would love to understand that process, but you just can't do it. If you have 17 variables and you see a difference, you have no idea whether it's variable 1 through 17 or an interaction between those variables. So I think that that's the reason why scientists often get this rap of being very detached is because there's just no other way to go about it. Eventually, we'd love to build back up, but you, you have to understand the pieces um, because looking at the pieces is the only way you can get a clear answer. <laughs> Uh, to those small questions, and then you build up from there. So, you know, cognitive science, I think, is at a really interesting point. It's right at the beginning of the field. I think we're just now realizing that uh, a lot of these social processes can be localized to specific brain areas, and that didn't have to be true. The brain didn't have to deal with information this way. It could have been that the brain just distributed it throughout. Uh, we just got lucky that the brain happens to to act in such a way that we can actually get a measurable signal. And so we know that the, the pieces are potentially there for us to then, you know, start building forward. We have to know how the brain responds to visual images before we start understanding how the brain responds to a Kurosawa film, right? But I think, you know, eventually we can start getting there. It just, uh, it's going to take time and science is going to move really slowly and it's a really exciting field to be in because it's new and because it gives pretty pictures of the brain uh, but but we can't get too far ahead of ourselves we have to realize that uh, science uh, oftentimes isn't informing these processes certainly right now cognitive science isn't informing uh, our social policies it's just trying to catch up to them so hopefully it'll sometime in the future be useful uh, but I feel like that's that's a little bit far in the future um, there's something that it's useful for right now. I think that um, that neuroscience in itself is helpful for fostering that very process you're talking about, that it, it really stimulates the imagination, that it's really interesting thinking about what's going on inside your brain, inside somebody else's brain, and insofar as that can help us understand uh, our communication with other people, I think that that's wonderful. Uh, but the actual kind of practical... Um, we know that brain region X has this effect on, on social interactions or that, that this kind of uh, uh, intervention affects the brain in this way. I think those types of uh, uh, practical, uh, that type of practical information coming from science to the world is, uh, is still a little bit far off. Okay, it sounds like we have to wait a little while for some more <laughs> of that practicality, right. but... I'm yeah. very grateful that you've uh, taken this uh, topic on and that you're working on it because, uh, you know, we really need the science to kind of build a culture of empathy and and build, you know, build that on how how things really work in, in the brain and in, in our biology. And so I'm very grateful that you're working on this and really... It's entirely my... <laughs> it's what? And I'll work as fast as I can. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.